Hi, my name is Karen, and I'm an American lay student of Ajahn Sachat, or Pra Ajahn Sachat Abhijato, who has given me the very special honor of being asked by him to record this book for you. This book was written by Pra Ajahn Sachat's own teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mahabua Nyanasampano, and is a spiritual biography written by him about his teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara. The title of the book is Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara, a spiritual biography by Acharya Mahabua Jnana Sampano. And it was published in 2005, translated into English by Bhikkhu Dick Silaratano. If you would like to learn how to download or get a hard copy of this book, or a list of which pages or chapters are read on each separate recording, please listen to the beginning of the first recording of this book. This book, in any form, is to be given away for free. Any ads you may see or hear in this recording have been put there by the platform you are using to listen or view with, for its own revenue in exchange for letting us use their platform for free. Please forgive me for any mispronunciations of names, places, or words, as I'm still learning how to pronounce Thai and Pali, and for any background noises, as I'm just making these recordings in my apartment with an unruly dog and in the middle of a city. We're continuing today on page 170 at the first full paragraph on that page. We're in chapter 3. As she listened to Acharya Mun present these reasoned arguments with such loving compassion, his spiritual partner felt as though she was being bathed in a stream of celestial water. Gradually, she regained her composure. Enchanted by his discourse, her mind soon became calm, her manner respectful. When he finished speaking, she admitted her mistake. My affection and my hopeless yearning for you have caused so much trouble. I believed that you had discarded me, going your own way, which left me feeling neglected. I became terribly disappointed. I couldn't stop thinking how useless and rejected I felt, with no one to turn to. But now that I have received the light of Dhamma, my heart is cool and contented. I can now put down the burden of misery that I have been carrying, for your dhamma is like a divine nectar washing over my heart, cleansing it and making it bright. Please forgive me whatever wrong I have done to you through my ignorance. I am determined to be more careful in the future. Never shall I again make such a mistake. When she finished speaking, Acharya Mun advised her to take birth in a more appropriate realm of existence telling her to cease worrying about the past. Respectfully, she promised to follow his advice, then made one final request. Once I have taken birth in a suitable realm, may I come and listen to your advice as before? Please give me your blessing for this. Once Acharya Mun had granted her request, she immediately vanished. The formless spirit having departed, Acharya Mun's cheetah withdrew from Samadhi. It was nearly 5 a.m. and almost light. He had not rested the entire night. Having begun sitting in Samadhi at around 8 p.m., he had spoken with the formless spirit for many hours into the night. Not long afterwards, the same spirit came to visit him again. This time, she came in the bodily form of a beautiful deva, Although, in deference to the especially revered monk she was visiting, she was not adorned in the ornamental style customary of the devas. Once arriving, she explained to him her new situation. After listening to your explanation, which removed all my doubts and relieved me of the misery that was tormenting me, I came to birth in the Tawa Timsa heavenly realm, a celestial sphere full of delightful pleasures, all of which I now enjoy as a result of the goodness we perform together as human beings. Although I experience this pleasant existence 
as a consequence of my own good deeds, I can't help remembering that you, venerable sir, were the one who initially encouraged me to do good. On my own, I would never have had the wisdom capable of accomplishing this to my complete satisfaction. Feeling fortunate enough to be reborn in heavenly splendor, I am wholly contented and no longer angry or resentful. As I reflect back on the immense kindness you've always shown me, it becomes apparent to me how important it is for us to choose discreetly in our lives, discerning everything from our work to our food to our friends and companions, both male and female. Such discretion is crucial for leading a smooth, untroubled existence. This is especially true when choosing a spouse to depend on, for better or for worse. Choosing a spouse merits special attention, for we share everything with that person, even our very breath. Every happiness and every sorrow along the way will necessarily affect both parties. Those who have a good partner, even though they may be inadequate in terms of their intelligence, their temperament, or their behavior, are still blessed to have someone who can guide and encourage them in dealing with all their affairs, both their secular affairs, which promote peace and stability in the family, and their spiritual affairs, which nourish the heart. All other matters will benefit as well, so they won't feel they are groping blindly in the dark, never certain how these matters will turn out. Each partner being a good person, they complement each other to create a virtual paradise within the family, allowing everyone to remain peaceful, contented, and free from strife at all times. Always cheerful, such a household is undisturbed by temperamental outbursts. All members contribute in creating this atmosphere. Each is calm and composed, firmly established in the principles of reason, instead of just doing whatever they like, which is contrary to the very moral principles that ensure their continued peace and contentment. Married couples work together to construct their own future. Together, they create good and bad comma. They create happiness and misery, virtue and evil, heaven and hell, from the very beginning of their relationship onward, to the present and into the future, an unbroken continuum. Being blessed with the chance to accompany you through many lives, I've come to realize this in my own situation. By your guidance, venerable sir, I have made goodness an integral part of my character. You have always steered me safely through every danger, never letting me stray in the direction of evil or disgrace. Consequently, I have remained a good person during all those lifetimes. I cannot tell you how deeply moved I am by all the kindness you've shown me. I now realize the harm caused by my past mistakes. Please kindly forgive my transgressions so that no lingering animosity remains between us. Assenting to the Deva's request, Achari Amun forgave her. He then gave her an inspiring talk encouraging her to perfect herself spiritually. When he had finished, she paid him her respects, moved off a short distance, and floated blissfully up into the sky. Some of the resentful comments she made when she was still a formless spirit were too strange to record here, so I've been unable to recount every detail of their conversation, and for that I ask your forgiveness. I am not really that satisfied with what has been written here either, but I feel that without it, a thought-provoking story would have been left out. We're moving on on page 172 to the next subsection in chapter 3 titled The Most Exalted Appreciation. On the nights subsequent to Achari Amun's attainment of Vimuti, a number of Buddhas, accompanied by their Arahant disciples, came to congratulate him on his Vimuti Dhamma. One night, a certain Buddha, accompanied by tens of thousands of Arahant disciples, came to visit. The next night, he was visited by another Buddha, who was accompanied by hundreds of thousands of Arahant disciples. Each night, a different Buddha came to express his appreciation accompanied by a different number of Arahant disciples. 
Acharya Man stated that the number of accompanying Arahant disciples varied according to each Buddha's relative accumulation of merit, a factor that differed from one Buddha to the next. The actual number of Arahant disciples accompanying each Buddha did not represent the total number of his Arahant disciples. They merely demonstrated the relative levels of accumulated merit and perfection that each individual Buddha possessed. Among the Arahant disciples accompanying each of those Buddhas were quite a few young novices. Acharya Mun was skeptical about this, so he reflected on it and realized that the term Arahant does not apply exclusively to monks. Novices whose hearts are completely pure are also Arahant disciples, so their presence did not raise issue with the term in any way. Most of the Buddhas who came to show their appreciation to Acharya Mun addressed him in much the following manner. I, the Tathagatha, am aware that you have escaped from the harmful effects of that monstrous suffering which you endured in the prison of samsara, so I have come to express my appreciation. This prison is enormous and quite impregnable. It is full of seductive temptations which so enslave those who are unwary that it is extremely difficult for anyone to break free. Of the vast number of people living in the world, hardly anyone is concerned enough to think of looking for a way out of dukkha that perpetually torments their bodies and minds. They are like sick people who cannot be bothered to take medicine. Even though medicines are plentiful, they are of no use to a person who refuses to take them. Buddha Dhamma is like medicine. Beings in samsara are afflicted with the painful, oppressive disease of chilesas, which causes endless suffering. Inevitably, this disease can be cured only by the medicine of Dhamma. Left uncured, it will drag living beings through an endless succession of births and deaths all of them bound up with physical and mental pain. Although Dhamma exists everywhere throughout the whole universe, those who are not really interested in properly availing themselves of its healing qualities are unable to take advantage of it. Dhamma exists in its own natural way. Beings in samsara spin around like wheels through the pain and suffering of each successive life in the natural way of samsara. They have no real prospect of ever seeing an end of dukkha. And there is no way to help them unless they are willing to help themselves by holding firmly to the principles of Dhamma, earnestly trying to put them into practice. No matter how many Buddhas become enlightened or how extensive their teachings are, only those willing to take the prescribed medicine will benefit. The Dhamma taught by all the Buddhas is invariably the same, to renounce evil and do good. There exists no Dhamma teaching more exceptional than this, for even the most exceptional kilesas in the hearts of living beings are not so exceptional that they can transcend the power of Dhamma taught by all the Buddhas. This Dhamma in itself is sufficient to eradicate every kind of kilesa there is, unless, of course, those practicing it allow themselves to be defeated by their kalesas, and so conclude the Dhamma must be worthless. By nature, kilesas have always resisted the power of Dhamma. Consequently, people who defer to the kalesas are people who disregard Dhamma. They are unwilling to practice the way, for they view it as something difficult to do, a waste of the time they could otherwise spend enjoying themselves despite the harm such pleasures cause them. A wise, far-sighted person should not retreat into a shell like a turtle in a pot of boiling water. It is sure to die because it can't find a way to escape. The world is a cauldron, boiling with the consuming heat of the kilesas. Earthly beings of every description everywhere must endure this torment, for there is no safe place to hide. No way to elude this conflagration burning in their own hearts, right there where the dukkha is. You have seen the truly genuine Tathagata, haven't you? What is the genuine Tathagata? The genuine Tathagata is simply that purity of heart you have just realized. 
the bodily form in which I now appear is merely a manifestation of relative conventional reality. This form does not represent the true Buddha or the true Arahant. It is just our conventional bodily appearance. Acharya Mun replied that he had no doubts about the true nature of the Buddha and the Arahants. What still puzzled him was how could the Buddha and the Arahants, having attained Anupadisesa Nibbana, without any remaining trace of relative conventional reality, still appear in bodily form? The Buddha explained this matter to him. If those who have attained Anupadisesa Nibbana wish to interact with other Arahants who have purified their hearts but still possess a physical mundane body, they must temporarily assume a mundane form in order to make contact. However, if all concerned have already attained Anupadisesa Nibbana without any remaining trace of relative conventional reality, then the use of conventional constructs is completely unnecessary. So it is necessary to appear in a conventional form when dealing with conventional reality. But when the conventional world has become completely transcended, no such problem exists. All Buddhas know events concerning the past and the future through nimittas that symbolize for them the original conventional realities of the occurrences in question. For instance, when a Buddha wishes to know about the lives of the Buddhas who preceded him, he must take the nimitta of each Buddha and the particular circumstances in which he lived as a device leading directly to that knowledge. If something exists beyond the relative world of conventional reality, that being vimutti, then there can be no symbol representing it. Because of that, Knowledge about past Buddhas depends on mundane conventions to serve as a common basis for understanding, as my present visit illustrates. It is necessary that I and all of my Arahant disciples appear in our original mundane forms so that others, like yourself, have a means of determining what our appearance was like. If we did not appear in this form, no one would be able to perceive us. On occasions when it is necessary to interact with conventional reality, the muti must be made manifest by the use of suitable conventional means. In the case of pure vimuti, as when two purified chittas interact with one another, there exists only the essential quality of knowing, which is impossible to elaborate on in any way. So, when we want to reveal the nature of complete purity, we have to bring in conventional devices to help us portray the experience of vimuti. We can say that vimuti is a self-luminous state devoid of all nimittas, representing the ultimate happiness, for instance, but these are just widely used conventional metaphors. One who clearly knows it in his heart cannot possibly have doubts about vimuti. Since its true characteristics are impossible to convey, Vimuti is inconceivable in a relative conventional sense. Vimuti manifesting conventionally and Vimuti existing in its original state are, however, both known with absolute certainty by the Arahant. This includes both Vimuti manifesting itself by means of conventional constructs under certain circumstances and Vimuti existing in its original unconditioned state. Did you ask me about this matter because you were in doubt or simply as a point of conversation? I have no doubts about the conventional aspects of all the Buddhas or the unconditioned aspects. My inquiry was a conventional way of showing respect. Even without a visit from you and your Arahant disciples, I would have had no doubts as to where the true Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha lie. It is my clear conviction that whoever sees the Dhamma sees the Tathagata. This means that the Lord Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha each denote the very same natural state of absolute purity, completely free of conventional reality, collectively known as the Three Jewels. 
I, the Tathagata, did not ask you that question thinking you were in doubt, but rather as a friendly greeting. On those occasions, when the Buddhas and their Arhat disciples came to visit, only the Buddhas addressed Acharya Mun. None of the disciples accompanying them spoke a word as they sat quietly composed, listening in a manner worthy of the highest respect. Even the small novices, looking more adorable and venerable, showed the same quiet composure. Some of them were quite young, between the ages of nine and twelve, and Acharyamun found them truly endearing. Ordinarily, the average person would see only bright-eyed, adorable children. Being unaware that they were arahants, one would most probably be tempted to fool around, reaching out playfully to stroke their heads without realizing the impertinence of doing so. I'm going to end there today on page 176. We are in chapter 3, and we'll start the next recording at the second full paragraph on page 176. Until next time, with Metta, bye-bye.